There is a love affair Between the moon and I We escape the Milky Way And a forever sky And all the stars Crash like waves Time could never find us as we slip beneath Nova sheets. Down below, you command the ocean's tides, but you spin alone in a prison of gravity. Sorry, we're late. Uh, welcome to Alien Guitar Secrets, Episode 6. And uh, that was an acoustic version of The Moon and I. So give me one minute to clean up this mess. All right. All right. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. I know I did. And welcome to Alien Guitar Secrets, where we talk about guitar. We do, you know, uh, we're late because my whole computer shut down and everything went awry. But here we are right now for you. Let me get this a little straighter. Whoops. Yep, is that all right? All right. Okay, here we go. Wait a minute. I'm not a perfectionist. No, I'm not. <laughs> okay. Uh, Stephen, can you hear me, buddy? Yep. Okay. okay. Uh, can, uh, am I coming through okay? Yep. All right. All right. Hey, thanks, guys, for sending comments and stuff to under it all at vi.com and alien guitar secrets at vi.com. Um, I've been reading through a lot of the comments, a lot of the letters and questions, and uh, thank you. And I'll be addressing a lot of them. Most of them are coming in for uh, under it all, which I'm kind of not surprised about. But here we are with Alien Guitar Secrets. And I wanted to, I wanted to do a little house cleaning because I've been seeing a lot of uh, emails, uh, a lot of messages about... my magnetic bracelet. All right, yeah. Uh, like I had mentioned uh, some, quite some years ago, I think it was during, might have been the fire garden tour, I started to develop these bumps on my fingers and I, I just didn't know what they were and they started to hurt and they were sticking out, especially right there and right there. And uh, I went to the doctor and he said, you have arthritis. And I said, no, I don't, <laughs> not gonna have arthritis. So I just did some research. Of course, I don't know what's going to happen, but I did a little research and I discovered these uh, magnetic bracelets. And the reason why they actually have some uh, uh, helpful uh, properties is because our body has irons in it and metals and stuff. And this is what this is at least what I was led to understand. 
So when uh, we wear a piece of metal uh, magnetic uh, on a particular part of the body, certain uh, healing cells go to that area. Uh, I don't understand the uh, uh, medical behind it, but I know one thing. When I started wearing it, the bumps went away <laughs> and they never came back. Uh, and where I got this, you can buy magnetic bracelets at various uh, online outlets, but the really good ones that I have found are from Jeff Scott. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, let me get the exact. Uh, it's called Jeffrey Scott Fine Magnetics. Let's see if I can. Yeah, Jeffrey Scott Fine Magnetics. And if you type that in, it'll, it'll come up. You can find it. They've got an incredible array of all sorts of uh, really fine jewelry that's magnetized. And the other, hang on, I've got to get my, uh, give me one second, guys. Yeah, and the other question that uh, keeps coming in is about my necklace. It's very interesting. I received this necklace. Uh, I was on tour, and I met this lovely, lovely young lady, Lucia Palantonio. And I'm not quite sure if I ever get their last name right, but she was this wonderful gal fan and she was Italian but she lived in Sweden and she is a jeweler and she made this specifically for me and she really put a lot of uh, love and care and infused it with her um, her appreciation and there's all these wonderful little things that are written on it uh, that are in Italian and Musica, but I've I've always uh, I don't wear a lot of jewelry, and this is, seems to be the only thing I've worn. Uh, but I wear it every day for like the past fifteen years or something. And a lot of people say, "Why do you wear that? Does it have some magical powers?" And uh, I'll never tell. <laughs> Actually, you know why I wear this? Besides the fact that this lovely Lucia made it for me, and it was such a special gift from her, and it had so much meaning for her and that I am attracted to it, but it's very handy <laughs> for my glasses. But if you're interested, uh, you can get one of these. Lucia can make you one. If you go to my website and you go to the merchandise page and you go to Melting the Metal, uh, it'll take you to a link to her. So it's just a kind of a pass-through site. Okay, so that is the housekeeping. So let's get started here. Now, I received a uh, request from a, a friend of my sister Lillian's, and it had to do with the signal path of the guitar. Now, the signal path, in, in whatever uh, uh, situation you're in, if you're a guitar player, you want to make sure, obviously, that the path from your guitar to your amplifier to the, if you're in the studio, to the microphones, uh, to the console, to the recording platform, that you, the integrity of that signal is as good as it can be. So I'm going to tell you about mine. I actually, Greg, Greg was here yesterday, and I made a little video of the, I did a studio tour, and I followed the, uh, the, the signal path of my guitar all the way through the entire system. But I shot the video, and it sure sucks. <laughs> I am just the worst. I couldn't believe it. I look back at it, and it's like I'm talking, and the camera's going all over the place, so I'm not going to use it because uh, uh, it'll only make you sick <laughs> and dizzy. <laughs> and then the guitar magazines will pick it up, and it'll be all wrong. So I'm going to explain it to you. But I, I would like to, at some point, make a really nice uh, video tour of the studio and show you the various signal paths that I use. But ultimately, coming out of your guitar, the shortest cable 
and the best quality cable going into your stomp boxes is uh, uh, surprisingly has quite an effect on the tone. The longer the cable gets, and frankly, I'm not, this isn't my area of expertise. I just know from being a guitar player, I probably can't explain it to you in exact electronic terms. I would need Peter Ahrens to be here to explain that, or Thomas. But um, the longer the cable, the, the more impedance uh, uh, sort of, I think, it mismatches and the top end sort of starts to go away. And you can use boosters and stuff, but anything you put in the signal path is going to have an effect on the tone. So I try to get right to the uh, signal. And I'm very fortunate because all of my cables that I use in the studio, my entire studio, is wired and all of my cables are wired with Larry DiMarzio's special sauce because Larry makes these cables. And Larry's like a, a, a artisan, you know? His pickups his, are, are completely detailed. I mean, this is a person that takes incredible pride in what he does because he loves it and he's always looking for the best quality. And as a, even just a pet project because these cables are so um, expensive to make, you know, they're not wild sellers, but uh, they are worth it to have going into your guitar rig. And they're DiMarzio, let's see if I can, you know, and they've got, oops, anyway. So anyway, I plug into a DiMarzio cable and I go into my Wawa, and then out of the Wawa, I go into a distortion, and then out of the distortion, I go into a uh, whammy pedal. Now, the thing about these effects is whenever you plug in an effect, it's going to compromise the signal path. So I actually have this device that when I do the studio tour, I'll give you a really good uh, explanation of. It's a Dave Friedman thing. And it, it's sort of like a switcher where you plug your effects into it and then you plug your signal. So when your effects are turned off, the uh, signal path bypasses your effect completely. So this gives it a more pure uh, uh, sort of a signal path. So then uh, coming out of, and, and the other thing that I might mention that's um, very uh, important, uh, if you're not, if, if you don't want to use batteries in all of your little devices, um, there's these uh, Chiox, uh, I'll show you when I do the studio tour, but uh, they feed the batteries, uh, the, the inputs, the electric imp electronic inputs of your stomp boxes so that you don't need batteries anymore and it's the only ones that I've found that actually don't create a uh, sort of a, a, a cross path with other electric that's going out to other pedal boards, which usually creates a hum. So keeping, the, the keeping hum out, that's one, one of the things that we discovered, and that was something that uh, Dave Friedman actually showed me. So then out of, the, uh, out of the pedal board, you guys, is it enough light? Let me turn this light on. Hang on one second. I spy in my studio. All right, I'm back. Thank you. Okay. Is that better? Yeah, probably. Okay. So then out of the pedal board, I go directly into the input of uh, your amplifier. I go into the input of my new Synergy Vi module because uh, that's what I use. And uh, uh, there's uh, when I do the studio tour, I'm going to go through the whole Synergy rig. It's fantastic. Uh, it's sort of like a, a a new lease on life for me when I discovered Synergy because of the just the the infrastructure of the modules being so. Uh, uh, the, the the schematics of the modules are actually uh, built on the schematics of the input uh, s section of some of the our favorite amplifiers. So you can get like a, you can get all sorts of Dave Friedman uh, amp pre's and they've got things that represent Fenders and Marshalls and then they have uh, technology that they licensed from some of these fantastic boutique amplifier makers, such as Soldano, Agnator. Um, I think they have Bogner ones. I'm not exactly sure, but tons. 
and they're just fantastic because now you have the uh, actual amp preamps of these very uh, boutique amplifiers and conventional popular amplifiers that you can switch in the rig. So then the signal goes into the, the Synergy rig and then there's a loop that comes out of the back and this is your effects loop. So I come out of my send and I go into a fractal uh, axe effects three. Well, in the studio, I use the two, well, no, stu in the studio, I have my Axe FX3. My touring rig has Axe FX2. So then I go into that mono and come out in stereo and then return that to power amps. And all the cabling, as I mentioned, is, is all very, uh, uh, that, that very good DiMarzio stuff. Okay, so then those uh, outputs of the power amp go to the speakers. And that's basically the straightest shot that I know and... Anything that I interrupt it with, always even hum eliminators, anything like that, always has an effect on the tone. There's always like something you got to give up. Um, so now, how do you come into uh, the, the questions? Were how do you come into your recording rig? Now, many of you have all sorts of different kinds of recording rigs. Maybe you're using Pro Tools, Cakewalk, Logic, GarageBand, and you have to get in. Uh, well, this is. Um, Oh, somebody's writing some. Can you just... Okay. I have to get the mic closer. How's this? I got my snowball. Can you hear me okay now? I can't really get it much closer. So, I'll bend down. Is that any better? Okay. These live things. Ugh, that's what you guys put me through. Okay, so now... Coming out of your speakers, miking your speakers, these days there's, you can even bypass using speakers because there's so many good units that are sort of like power soaks, like the aux or something like that, where you just plug into the speaker output of your amplifier and you go directly into your recording rig. And that in and of itself bypasses a tremendous amount of anomalies such as phase cancellation when you move uh, uh, speak uh, microphones around but what I do is I use three microphones on each uh, cabinet and they don't look like this I use a 57 uh, sure 57 that's like the workhorse if there's only one microphone you ever want to get for a guitar it's a SM57 and they're not very expensive and uh, uh, Stephen, is it? Am I coming through okay, audibly? Is it loud enough? Yeah, just trying to stay as close to that mic as you can. Okay, I'll start. I'll hold my snowball. Okay, so SM57 workhorse, not very expensive, but you got to get a good one. They're sometimes inconsistent. I uh, have a a, a friend that uh, actually tweaks them and uh, refurbishes them. Um, I use a, a Sennheiser 421 and a Bayer 150. And those are the three mics that I put on, on the speaker. And then I, that's one speaker, that's the right side. And the left side, I do the same thing. And then they all come, they go into the wall. Everything's wired to Marzio. And then they... Um, Hang on, I gotta turn you down. And then they come into the patch bay, uh, which is this mess over here that I'll show you when I do the tour. And then once the uh, microphones are coming up into the patch bay, they need to go into mic pre's. Now mic pre's have a lot to do with the quality of the sound that you're capturing. If you don't have, if you're gonna spend more money that you have, uh, besides being able to afford a microphone SM57 um, you want to get a good mic pre okay and they they can be a little more expensive I, I don't know what a 57 is these days maybe I remember when I used to buy them they were like 8500 bucks but uh, so they're kind of cheap but mic pre's can be more expensive Greg and I had done massive shootout tests and compared multitudes of mic pre's and the one that I Ch chose that has always been my favorite really is the APIs and I used to have an old API console so those 
uh, microphones have to have the power, they go into the APIs. And when I do the tour, I'll show you the whole console and where those APIs are. And then I will occasionally then go through a, a, a compressor, and I usually use a 500 series, or um, I really like the, uh, the tube techs. Those are fantastic. And then into an EQ. And the EQs that I go into are custom-made EQs by Steve Furlot. Uh, that's when I'm recording. Um, when I mix, I like to use Poltex because I try to get the best sound I can when I'm recording. Uh, not so much EQ. I, don't, I, I use very little compression, very little EQ. So then you've got your guitar sound. Uh, and then you have to get that from the analog domain into your workstation. So you need a converter. And, uh, and that's if you're doing digital, obviously. And uh, we have been, we've, through the years, converters have changed and the quality of them has changed. And we've always had, I've always tried to get the very best ones that I could. I always try to kept, kept being updated. And I think the ones we're using now are the Burls. Um, really good. We used Apogee in the past. And even the, you know, the, the, uh, if you have Pro Tools and you have an HD rig, in the early days, the converters in Pro Tools was, were, were not superior by any means, but they've gotten tremendously better, and now they're on par with anything that's out there. So we go through the converters and then into Pro Tools, and we do our recording. Then I release a record, and hopefully you like it. And we all go to heaven in a little row boat. So anyway, let me uh, read these qu these questions. Hello, thanks for uh, the, the, some thoughts about the Steve Vibrato. Okay. Potential questions. What is your typical signal chain from guitar to recording console? Well, there it is. <laughs> Do you prefer certain mics? Yes, I mentioned. Uh, hang on a second. All live from the mouth of a master musician. All right. <laughs> okay. Uh, I thought I saw some Neve 1073s in the Harmony Hut. Yes, the console actually has 1073 slots, and I do use them occasionally for various things, but uh, they've got great EQ. It's actually, uh, they may fit, the, uh, the, the slots may look like 1073s, and I have some 1073s, but I actually use the BAE 1073s and uh, 1088s, 1028s, because I just prefer them. You know, when we did the, the knockout test, uh, they, they just came up superior because they had extra bands of EQ and extra headroom and a lower noise floor. So that, uh, uh, that's what I use normally um, when I'm, if I'm not using the API. And the EQ on the um, BAEs are just fabulous. Uh, and I described the compression and the EQ. Tell us about your recording technique. How many guitar tracks are on the typical Steve Vai song? How heavy is the layering of the guitars? Well, it's according to the song, obviously. When I was doing Alien Love Secrets, I determined to myself that uh, I didn't want to do any guitar overdubs. I just wanted it to be bass, drums, and guitar. And there's little keyboards in there on a couple of songs. I mean, you wouldn't want Tender Surrender without a keyboard, right? A sexy organ. Uh, and the only time I overdubbed a guitar was uh, to double kill the guy with the ball. Uh, other than that, some of my recordings have tremendous amounts of guitars. I can go up to 60 tracks, 70 tracks of guitars, but you may not notice because some of them are just little flavors here and there and all sorts of different kinds of stringed instruments that I'm calling guitars. I mean, there might be banjos, there might be uh, mandolins, uh, Cavacchinos, you know, ouds, sars, all these kinds of things, saz. Hmm. So some songs is pretty heavy layering. Uh, let me try to pick a few. Well, something like Freak Show Excess has quite a bit. I haven't really done guitar armies like uh, Brian May <laughs> because I've tried it, but it just never sounded uh, like Brian. So. <laughs> <laughs> what I mean by that, it never sounded good enough to me. Uh, but I still plan on doing some of that. It just takes a real focus. <clears throat> Do you record through multiple amps at once, like 
you play on your stage rig? Well, my stage rig is one amp. And whatever the main head is, these days it's the Synergy, that's it. Uh, in the past, I, I've only ever used one amp live. Well, I've had three amps, but they were on switchers. Uh, and it was rare that they were uh, uh, all on at once, except when I brought once a stereo rig with a mono, a little mono cabinet, a mono amplifier for clean to support the dirty. Uh, but in the studio, there's a tremendous amount of reamping. I'll tell you what reamping is. This is a, this is fabulous. So when I record my guitar tones, uh, and I get the guitar tone, I always record a direct signal also, a DI. Because if you have a DI signal, then you can reamp it. And what that means is you take that DI and you send it back out into another amplifier. And hang on one second. Okay. So you have your DI signal and you send it back out into a reamp box. And that's another, another brick in the wall, finding the right reamp box that will give you uh, a, 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 a signal with integrity that is virtually exactly like the input of the direct. So went through many of them. But the first one that I ever found, which was perhaps one of the first ones that was ever made, it was made by John Coonanberry. Which, uh, and this was way back in the 80s, late 80s, I think, I think. And uh, he was working with Joe, Joe Satriani, and Joe sent me this. And this was one of the very first reamp boxes. And you plug your DI signal in here, and then it comes out here and goes to an amplifier. So you can take your signal and put it through another amplifier and record it, and mix it with the other amplifier you recorded originally. But you got to have the right uh, uh, reamper. And what the only one that I found that works any near this one is uh, radial design, because they bought the technology from John Coonanberry. And one of the cool things, I've got it in the rack down here, and one of the cool things about the radial is that it also acts as a splitter, so you can go in and come out like three or four different outputs and send them to various amplifiers. So I used to do that, and I still do. So when you hear one of my songs, you may, I may have recorded it with one amp, but then in the, and sometimes I record it with multiple amps, but then in the mixing process, I'll take, it, I'll take one send of the DI through the reamper and send it to a little sort of fender. And then another one might be another kind of amp, and then another amp. And they're all mic'd differently and in different locations, and the uh, ambient mics are different. So then you have a lot to choose from for just one performance. But you got to be very careful when it comes to stacking up various amplifiers on top of each other with the same signal. Because what happens is that the one, every amplifier has a different kind of way that it uh, sounds, and that means that the waveform is different, and they're all based on these sine waves. And if you look very closely, what I always do is I zoom in on Pro Tools to see the, the sine wave of each microphone for each amp, and I line them up, because that's the thing that kills your tone when you have more than one microphone and especially when you have six microphones on one amp, and then you start reamping, you I could end up having 25 microphones for one sound. So mixing those together, they have to be in alignment, or your your the, the tone is just going to be crap. <laughs> and uh, but when they are in alignment, and you start stacking these sounds up, you get you you can get things that just you can't get any other way. So I do that occasionally. Um, what is your typical signal chain from the, oh, we did that, okay. Uh, any mic preferences for, did that. Gonna, gonna describe my actual miking technique when I do the video. Uh, and it's really cool because I learned it from Eddie Kramer. And Eddie Kramer 
uh, is one of the greatest rock producers. He he and engineers. He recorded Jimi Hendrix's records, <laughs> and he recorded Led Zeppelin, and this was his mic technique, and it really worked. And uh, I will show it to you in my next video. But it's basically three mics positioned a particular way on one speaker. Uh, hmm. My preference for miking acoustic guitars. What's your preference? Okay. Well, I always like to have some kind of a shotgun mic on the neck because this is the. Uh, hang on. First, I, I always come out, and this is my Paul Reed Smith acoustic. I have no words for how great this guitar is. <laughs> I almost feel like I don't even deserve it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I come out of this, and so now you have a DI signal from the uh, pickup configurations that are actually in the, the acoustic guitar. And then this shotgun mic usually sits, I, I like it, it's, the, the tone is, you can't really see it very well. But anyway, it's pointing at the neck at about a 45 degree angle, and it picks up all of the... Uh, crystal clean kind of sounds. And I like fret noise sometimes, so it, it, it gets some of that. And then I come with a, uh, what we use here is an AKG C214. And these mics, uh, this mic is for the body of the guitar. And usually, the, you know, I've, I've experimented a bit where, where, the, where the tone resonates. You know, where's, where's the good tone? And it's actually right, right about here, but it has a lot of bottom end in it, you know, it, and it, a lot of it has to do with obviously where the uh, sound hole is, but right about here seems to be the sweet spot. So I've got that mic there, that mic there, and then of course you have to phase them out. They're usually completely out of phase. Gotta check phasing or it's just gonna sound thin and weenie. And you don't want a thin, well, never mind. Okay. All right, so that's acoustic miking. Uh, do you record in the studio with a band live or individually? Well, it, 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 it varies. Uh, most of the time I do everything myself. I build tracks and then I bring guys in. Uh, I actually rarely cut live, you know. Um, if I do, it's basically uh, just to get the track with the bass player and the drummer. And then I, I kind of operate on the tracks afterwards. So, but we do do a lot of live recording uh, in sound checks, and some of you have seen that. And uh, even the I had mentioned the Moon and I is actually a um, sound check jam. It was originally called "Flying Over Athens" because that's where it was recorded at a sound check in Athens, Greece. One take, and then I manipulated it, but. Uh, a lot of stuff, probably 10, 15, maybe 15 percent of the tracks that I end up releasing are tracks that are cut in sound checks, and I tweak them a bit. Uh, but otherwise, when I'm in the studio, it's usually me against the computer. <laughs> okay. Do you get tape fright? Or when the tape starts rolling, do you get nervous or anxious? Good question. I actually used to when I was younger and when I first started recording. Uh, when I was in college, uh, we just, you know, we didn't, we didn't have real studios or anything. But every time I was in a studio and the red light was on, I'm like, oh, God, we're recording live. Oh, boy, better get it right. Uh, uh, but when I was with Frank, um, I was very confident in the parts that I knew. So I was very eager when that red light went on because I knew that whatever I did, for the most part, Frank would probably get a kick out of it. So I didn't really have so much red light fever for that uh, from then on because uh, sitting in the um, studio and being able to work on things, you, you know, when the, when, when the tape is recording, I've just been doing it for so many years, you just, you know that if you don't like what you play, you're just going to do it again. 
Uh, so that kind of helps to eliminate any anxiety of red light uh, fever or fear, whatever it is. All right. Do you try to record in single takes or do you record in sections? Okay. Uh, according to how inspired I am in that moment. Uh, a lot of times if I'm doing solos, uh, it's just, you know, and what I'll do is do a pass of a, of a solo and maybe I'll do three, two or three passes and then listen back and I might cut together, comp together the best bits. Occasionally it's the first solo, one shot, not very often, because uh, what, I, what I usually do, which is a little unorthodox, uh, and I'm going to give it away, <laughs> uh, and I don't care. Uh, what I like to do when I have like a solo section, I look at it as an art project that I can construct. And for some songs, I will tell myself, okay, you got this much time, just fill it right now, go. And then many times I'll say, okay, you're not going to get off that easy, bye. <laughs> I'll take a song like uh, on Modern Primitive, there's a song called End We Are One. I feel, for me at least, that it's probably one of the most exotic guitar performances I I've ever done. It's my favorite. It has so much phrasing and melody and touch. And before I did it, I, I sat down and I said, okay, you've got a lot of time here. <laughs> um, Every single thing you play has to be unique. That's what I told myself. And you can tell yourself that too if you're interested in that kind of thing. So in order for me to do that, everything, now when I say unique, I mean unique to me, different than anything I've done before. Now, of course, there's things that are going to, oh, I've heard you do that and do that, but that's, that's inevitable. But the, the gist of the ideas, so I'll take like the first four bars or eight bars and loop them and sit for an hour and just play until I find something that's like, ah, oh, there's, there's something. There's something that I've, I'm, it, it's got something in it that I, I haven't really done and I haven't heard. And if I haven't heard anybody else do it, that's a bonus. <laughs> Um, it's hard because, you know, Jeff Beck has done just about everything. <laughs> uh, so I'll take, that, I'll take that section and I'll craft an idea. And then I'll work on that until that section is, is good. And then I'll go on to the next section. And I'll do that for, I, I, well, I did that for uh, And We Are One. And if you ever listen to that solo, let me see if I can, I don't know if you hear it if I get it up. No, the, the, the way that the computer is wired right now so that you guys can hear me, I can't get this stuff to play. Hang on. I don't know if you can hear that. No, nah, it's not loud enough. All right, never mind. Sorry. Okay. Uh, but if you listen to that song, And We Are One, that you, you, you'll hear it, each section was focused on. And then I wouldn't move on until I felt like something came out of me that was unique. And there was there's so many fun, interesting, quirky, beautiful riffs in that solo, uh, at least to me. And, uh, and then sometimes it's just one shot. And if a if you take something like uh, Tender Surrender or For the Love of God, they, that, that, that whole cell, uh, solos, the solos in those songs to me are melodies. And, and that's what I, I love to incorporate into solos is melody. And so with something like For the Love of God, I don't change it because it's, to me, it's, it's right the way it is. And I don't want to use it as an excuse to just improvise. It's not 
It's not an improvise. Of course, you can improvise over it, but it's not that kind of a song for me. It's a musical statement that has a sentence and a story. Same with a lot of the songs that I record that, that whose solo sections have a particular energy in them. Uh, and then some songs, uh, you know, the solos are just done one time in the studio, and when I do them live, I just make something up, you know, again. I don't use, I, I may not stick. I may stick to sort of a, a basic idea of the ebb and flow of an existing solo. So that's that. Do you enjoy the recording process, or is it just a necessary component to bringing people to live performances. No, I enjoy it all. The recording process has always been so interesting and fun. It's like a, it's like you're hunting for treasures, you know. And um, there's nothing that I have enjoyed more than getting an idea and then manifesting it in the in the studio. Uh, and I'm fortunate because. Usually when I've been in the studio long enough, I start itching to get on tour because I love touring too. So um, then I get on tour and I do these huge tours and by the time the tour is winding down, I'm itching to go back home. So it's always kind of like a nice balance. And then, um, uh, so, so this way I'm not, I don't really prefer one over the other. I like them both. Uh, they, they kind of walk hand in hand, touring and recording. All right. Uh, what is your psychological process when you are recording? How is it different than playing live? Well, obviously playing live, uh, there's no second take. <laughs> so uh, in the studio, it's all experimenting, stacking stuff, um, doing something, listening to it, maybe redoing it or doing a, a little part of it, redoing a little part. Uh, when it's live, it's just bam, just like we are right now. <laughs> so you just, you know, it's just a whole different mindset. It's, it's just a whole different approach. And many times that mindset is incorporated in the studio where it's just, you're just going, you're recording and whatever comes out, that's it. All right. Uh, okay, thank you. We have an, another. Okay. Do you zone out, a.k.a. enter another dimension in your mind when you're playing in front of an audience? If yes, can you describe that feeling? Well, zone out. Um, what I do is I, I try to enter that zone of uh, just non-thinking awareness where all of my senses are fired up, you know. Um, when I, when I'm, what I'm looking at is, you know, the audience. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the audience. I'm not thinking about anything. I'm feeling them. They have to create an opening to feel them. Uh, So then when I get on stage and I'm actually playing, okay, uh, I don't really, I try not to think. You know, I just try to be connected. Now, what, what does that mean? You're not, you're not thinking when you're playing. How do you know where to go? How do you know what, what, what the next part of the song is? You know it. If you've worked and you've rehearsed it and you've got it back here, you just go, it just happens. I don't have to think, oh, oh, no, here comes the B section. What is that? Okay, the, I, my hand's got to go here. Now, it's just bam. And if it doesn't happen and I make a mistake, which I do occasionally, it's because I haven't prepared enough, I haven't had enough time to really prepare, or I uh, lost my focus. And that happens. I'm, I'm not a, a Zen master. <laughs> you know, I can't keep the focus entirely. Uh, but a lot of times I do, and that's the zone where... The music is just instantly, this, I can't, can't really, nobody really can. Uh, it just wells up out of you from that infinite realm of potentiality based on your desire in that moment. And you can watch it happen through you. Okay. Um, 
here's something that I would highly recommend. I'm going to talk about this. If, if you're a musician, actually, this is good for anybody. And th this is what I find myself thinking about a lot when I'm playing. Um, I put my attention on, on, my, uh, on my inner body, the energy field, and I relax. I relax, 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 relax. There's, that is the secret. That is the key to being able to flow. Being, and, and when I say relax, I, don't, I mean not just your body, but your mind. You know, you can slow down the thinking. But when you're in that relaxed state, you have control. If you're in a tense state, you, you, most people may not realize how tense they are when they're on stage. Some people aren't. You, you may feel when you're on stage that's your only real comfort zone, you know. Uh, but some people, there's, a, there's just a, a tension. There's a, when you're in front of people, once the, you, can, you can practice in your bedroom till you're blue in the face, and you can be a god in your bedroom. <laughs> But once you get on that stage and the lights go out, everything changes. Everything, your awareness is uh, almost sent into a, um, a almost a, a sort of disarray because well, 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 the environment isn't the same as my bedroom, you know, or my little studio. Perhaps for some people, but here's... The, the secret is whenever you feel that way, or whenever anything is going on in your mind when you're performing, experiment with this. Just try this. Do it even when this is done. Go and pick up your guitar or whatever instrument. And as you're playing, take your focus off of what you're playing. Your fingers will, will continue. And put your attention on your body and just, just relax it. Keep your posture straight and re just really relax and hold that feeling of relaxing. That's what I do live. And I watch everything happening. The moment that I lose that connection with the relaxing, I'm gone. Uh, I'm in my head. And that's not where the best stuff comes from. So you can't even have control of your fingers to their potential unless you're in a state of being relaxed. Relaxed from thinking about the audience, what they're thinking. This is a big thing that goes on in some people's heads when they're playing. New players usually, some, maybe not you, but uh, some, they're up there and they're thinking, how do I sound? What, you know, what, uh, what are those people thinking? You know, we went through that. The moment you take your attention and put it on, on the energy field of your inner body and you relax, there's no room for nonsensical thoughts. And then, the, but, but, but what does happen is that there's a connection, you know, you, you become connected. And you're also, when you're connected and you're feeling the audience, you're connecting with the audience. So let me tell you this great story. You're going to love this. And hopefully you'll never forget it because... It had a powerful impact on me, this story I'm going to tell you. Okay. My wife's father, Richard, and Richard's brother, Uncle Hugo, were world-class runners. As a matter of fact, at one time, they both held the world record for running their, their uh, specific distances. Uncle Hugo, I think, did the short, uh, no, the longer runs. And um, uh, Richard did the, the shorter ones. But, uh, and Uncle Hugo actually made it to the Olympics, the Pan, Pan American Olympics, and got a gold medal. And this is how he told me he did it. <laughs> uh, he told me this story about when he was training once with his coach. And the coach said, okay, what I want you to do, and, and first of all, Uncle Hugo himself was one of the most amazing people he passed away. He was a doctor. He's, he delivered over 10,000 babies. He lived up north, northern California and was a, ta a, t a doctor for this town for 60 years, 65 years. And he was beloved because his approach to healing people was relatively unorthodox. He talked to them. He asked them about what was going on in their life. And the stories that he would tell me about the correlation between what was happening personally in these people's lives and their physical ailments was remarkable. 
So, I mean, Uncle Hugo turned me on to so much great stuff. He actually uh, inspired me to go spend time in a Buddhist monastery, the monastery at Mount Shasta, because he had been there. And uh, he told me this story. So here he is getting ready. I digress a lot, don't I? But I get back, get back to the story. So Uncle Hugo's coach says to him, okay, you go, I want you to do this run, and, and you know, they're training for the Olympics, and uh, I want you to do this run, and I want you to run as fast as you can. I want you to run, I want you to give it 100%. When you think you don't got any more in you, push harder. Push harder and run as fast as you can. So un Uncle Hugo's all excited, you know, he's like, okay, all right, ready, ready. And the coach's there, and he's got the, the, the uh, stopwatch and he goes ready go and uncle hugo starts running and he is running and he's running as fast and as hard as he can he was at 100 percent of his capacity and when he felt he didn't have any more he pushed more and he got his time and click coach says all right take a break they take a break he comes back goes now what i want you to i just want you to experiment here i want you to do the same run but this time i only want you to run at 90%. I want you to just pull back just a little bit from 100% where you're not fighting so hard. Just pull back. So Uncle Hugo thought, mm, okay, try it. So they get ready and click. And Uncle Hugo runs. And he's running. He's running fast, but he just pulled back a little bit. He was at 90%. And he got his time. His 100% run was one of his worst runs. His 90% run was his best run. <laughs> and I understand why. Because you don't have control when you're pushing, 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 pushing. Uh, that little bit of headroom gives you flow. It gives you elegance. And when you're moving in the flow elegantly, things happen powerfully. They happen fast. There's less mistakes, if any. And um, that's what I think about when I'm performing. And I realize that your fingers cannot move as accurately or as powerfully when, they're, when you're trying to go 100%. They're back a little bit on it. Relax. And the way you do that, take your attention off and put it in your body because that's where the fingers are getting tense. And you relax. And that, so the little moon and I, acoustic version that I did. The entire time I was playing it and singing it, I was, to answer your question, I was in a state where my mind was in, in a portion of my attention, the large portion of my attention was in relaxing. And whenever I did that, the notes would come out. Whenever my attention wasn't there, it just wasn't right. So when it, when it's when something is feeling really right, like I'm connecting, that's when I'm in that state of being relaxed. And that is a it's a life treasure. It's feels like liberation. Um, it's just like a form of freedom that I can't really explain. Many of you know what it is. You got it. So I would say experiment with that idea, 90%. All right. Steve, what are you thinking as you play? Chords, keys, scales, etc. Okay, uh, again, I try not to think of anything, but that doesn't mean that all the time that you're honing your skills, honing your craft, that you don't think of anything. Of course you have to think. Thinking is there if you need it. If I, you know, I mean, it there comes in a little flat, you know, B flat minor. Okay, you know, whatever. Um, but it's according to the situation. Uh, what I like to do and what I, would, uh, what I would recommend is in the period that you're honing your skills, honing your craft, you're doing your ear training, you're identifying with musical atmospheres, you're feeling the energy of other musicians, you're, uh, you're um, learning all your theory, you're practicing, you're, you're, you're listening to your tone, you're doing maybe scales and exercises or whatever it is that you, you, you might be doing to hone your, hone your skill 
and hone your ears so when the time comes that you're actually on stage uh, or you're just you're sitting home and you just want to play, those things are there, but they're in the background. You, you pull from them. So I, when I say I don't, I, I don't think, well, yeah, of course, I, I hear a chord and I recognize it and then I will, and sometimes my mind will say, oh, you know, that's a C-sharp minor 11 chord. But I don't need to tell myself that. It's just like a knowing, okay? Let's, I may not know it's C-sharp, but I hear the tonality of it and if I find one note that works, the whole neck is open up. And as that net, the reason why that neck is open up for me, and I don't have to think about scales or chords or anything, is because I did the pre-work. You know, it was always kind of there. Now, that doesn't mean that occasionally I, I'll be playing and all of a sudden I'll, I'll hear a chord and I go, and I'll think, I bet an altered scale or a diminished scale would work really well here. But it doesn't come into my mind like, let me see, will, it, will a diminished scale work here? Okay, I've got this note here. And if I go here, then, you know, that'll work. That might be rare. That's for the practicing. But live, it's like, it's just, it's not a thought. It's just a go diminished. <laughs> so, yes, on one level, the theory is there, but it's not called upon so consciously. Unless, of course, I'm playing with some jazz bows. Then, these days, I don't. I can't keep up. <laughs> okay. Hi, Steve. Greetings from Buenos Aires, Argentina. My name is John. I want to ask if you can teach me your tapping technique. My tapping technique. Sorry for your English. I can understand 100% what you speak, but I write too bad. Somehow I understand what you're asking. All right. My tapping technique. Okay. Let's see what I got here. Okay, we don't have the uh, Pro Tools rig today, so I hope you can hear this. Stephen, can you hear that okay? I'll turn it up. Okay, now I remember uh, tapping. Oh, hang on one second. Give me one minute, guys. Here's my tone. Okay, so uh, tapping. I was probably 14. And, or 15, and I was listening to um, uh, Frank Zappa, Inca Rhodes, his solo, one of the greatest guitar solos for me that I've ever heard. And he was doing this thing with his pick. He called it like a bagpipe sound. And I thought, what is that? And I figured out he was tapping. So I started to experiment with that. I kind of liked what it did. And, you know, I was doing things like, you know, oh, cool, you know. Uh, but then uh, I think I, maybe I was 18 or 17, 18 when Van Halen came out. And once Edward hit the scene, I mean, that was tapping, right? And uh, so the tapping I was doing when I was in college and stuff before I heard Edward was a little, it was more limited. Uh, it, it, didn't, it didn't have a, a great tone. But once we all heard Edward tapping, we're like, oh, okay, there, there's it. But I didn't want to sound like that. I couldn't. And also... It just felt like, why, you know? But I did like the tapping idea, and the first time I started to develop my tapping technique was when I was in Alcatraz. That's when I really started developing it, because there was this one riff, and I can't remember what it was, but it was part of the song called Too Young to Die, Too Drunk to Live, something like that. And it was an Ingve riff, and it was all these arpeggios, and I ended up, uh, and, and I, I don't, it's not my style, you know? play those kind of arpeggios with his, uh, you know, the way he, he does them. Um, that's a whole style that he's got. Um, so I developed this way of doing it by using these two fingers. So I was, when I was thinking about hammering and uh, tapping, 
you, you, you have this, a lot of people do that. I just don't like that. Uh, for some reason, it never felt right using my uh, index finger there. And then you got to fool with the pick, you know, you got to get back to the pick. So I just thought I can hold the pick and actually do tapping with these two fingers. <laughs> So I started to uh, work on that kind of thing. Very simple, you know. So you get that. So it's it's these two fingers, and then occasionally, you know, I, I since I've got the pick there, I can. Uh, use the pick without having to go like this. I mean, some people, it's fine, but, so when you're tapping, you obviously want to make sure that your, your notes are, your, the notes are sounding good and clean. Now, um, I will do some fl flurry type tapping sometime. <laughs> kind of thing, but uh, to me, sometimes that sounds a little uh, antiquated, you know, the, the fast. So, hang on one second. So, um, what, I, what I try to do more these days is kind of figure out ways of tapping that actually are musical. As opposed to just fast riffing. And there's millions of ways to, well, millions, there's quite a few ways to learn how to tap, but that's basically my technique. you can do that kind of thing. Tapping is, uh, I think, is if you start out slow and you make sure all the notes sound good. Um, there you go. And if in doubt, you always have YouTube. <laughs> all right. How can I play? Uh, how can I make my playing less sloppy? Play slower. Uh, it's a, actually a very good question, because so many times when I see young musicians, young guitar players learning how to play, they can get into habits sometimes that uh, will be, uh, will g give them limitations in their tone and in their ability to blossom to another kind of level. And some of those limitations are, and I'll just, I'll just give these to you, uh, because they can be helpful if you want to play cleaner. And, uh, and I know because I've, I've made those mistakes, you know. Uh, when I first started playing, when I first started practicing, I didn't have a chair, so I sat on the floor against the bed, and I had this double neck guitar uh, at one point, and that's when I really started developing my picking, but my hand was picking here over the neck. And you can see, if you look at some Zappa 
footage of me playing. It was this kind of thing. I mean, I could pick fast, but the tone wasn't there. You know, it was sloppy. And even uh, today, I, I'm not like um, an immaculate player by any stretch of the imagination because uh, I like the visceral uh, sort of approach. I like a little, a little edgy, a little sloppy, uh, but controlled, you know. Um, but it can't be too sloppy, obviously. Um, I mean, I, I recently saw a, a video of uh, Mateus Mancusa is his name, and I was pretty stunned. I mean, the evolution of the guitar is uh, firmly secure in the hands of people like him and Daniel Guitardo and these kinds of players that, that it's just new level, you know, the tone, the touch, the notes. They're very clean players, no slop. <laughs> And there's many others. Uh, for me, there's a little slop, but I like it. Uh, so how do, you, how do you play less sloppy? You have to examine your style. And you, like, simple things like just the positioning of your hand. It's, so many times I see players, they, they, they're coming down on the strings this way. You just can't eventually get your mojo happening. You got to kind of have that coming down on the string kind of thing as opposed to like this so more like that less like this and no chords are ever going to come out really clean unless you're coming straight down so that's uh, one thing to consider another another thing you to get your to clean up you really have to take a, a close look well also when you when you hit the note with your left hand you got to make sure you're hitting the right note and not pushing too hard or it's going to go sharp or bending it because then your intonation sucks and there's nothing worse than bad intonation okay just just learn good intonation <laughs> all right that's one of the things that um you need to transcend as an amateur is bad intonation um so then another, uh, another thing to consider is just the movement of your hands. You know, if I do that, I'm not going to go, you know, it's economy of motion. You, you move your hands as little as necessary to get, you move your fingers as little as necessary to get to the note. Now, the big uh, uh, component to the tone and your ability to play clean is in the right hand. And it's, it's all where you pick. Like I had mentioned, I used to pick like this and it's admitted. And then at one point I changed. Now you gotta understand that any, any deviance that you make from this uh, deviation from any of these pick angles you're going down like this or like that hear the tone compared to and then where you pick so that you, you, you if you want to play cleaner examine and uh, examine your right hand and listen and find the the sweet spot of the tone and then that's where you start to work your your picking so, now there's many different picking techniques and Mine is not one to really write home about. I'm not a really great picker. Uh, I used to be much more um, connected with fast picking, uh, but I actually had an unfortunate, funny accident on tour many years ago with G3. Maybe one of these days I'll tell you about it if I have the courage, because it's really weird. But I lost something there. so playing really fast kind of picking stuff. Uh, I don't really do that often. I had to swap up my style again to be more left hand. See, that's, that, that's not a lot of picking. Um, but you have to find what's right for you. But you just want to make sure that the same thing applies. You, 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 there's economy of motion. And uh, usually the picking that I like to do is, it's more of a, 
but it changes constantly based on the tone of the note that I want to hear, you know, the, that, that personality in the note. So practice slow and make sure every note sounds good and then slowly get faster and slowly get faster. And that's how that will clean up your sloppiness uh, if you're patient. Uh, or it will help develop uh, a cleaner approach uh, within the way that you play. Okay. Uh, how do you feel about... Okay, wait a minute, sorry. Can you still wear your leather pants? I'm going to die in those things. <laughs> and yes, I rock them better now than ever. Steve, how do you determine the passing notes when going through or creating scales? Okay, passing notes are the notes that you find that work between uh, when you link various uh, melody lines together. So let's just say you're in the key of A minor. You did blues scale. There's a little passing note. So chromatics, the, the sharp four, the, the, the uh, flat five in blues, is a very popular passing tone uh, in blues music. And uh, you can basically make any note a passing tone as long as you end on a note that works. So I can even do whole riffs that are not necessarily associated with the key, but if you end up on a, if you resolve it, then it'll give it the, a sense of working. So if you... was just a little flurry of notes that didn't have anything to do with anything, but because of where they ended, it worked. As far as um, getting into some of the conventional passing tones that are uh, legal in jazz, <laughs> um, that's another whole story that, because uh, uh, th there's so many. But basically, experiment with notes that are outside of the scale you're working on and just resolve them into a, a note or a phrase that works in the key that you're playing. Some things will sound terrible, and some things will sound pretty cool. I don't uh, usually, I don't really like the sound of conventional out notes, meaning when I see somebody playing or, and I hear a flurry of notes that are just like the obvious uh, pattern, you know, a pattern that exists uh, within a conventional music theoretical movement. Uh, it just it sounds fusiony and worked out, and uh, so that's why a lot of times when I play, uh, some of the notes are really weird. <laughs> but experiment with that. Okay. How do you feel about tuning a half step down all the time for a cover act, even when a song is in 440? I hate it. <laughs> it throws me off, actually. It does, because uh, uh, so, some people it doesn't matter at all. But if I listen to a record that I really like, and then the band plays it tuned down a half step, or I have to play the song tuned down a half step, it's kind of like, I don't know, uh, it, 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 it's kind of like... Um, taking a shower with a rubber suit on or something. It's just it's doesn't, there's a better funny analogy. I don't know what it is yet. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think it's because my ear is so used to hearing things at a normal pitch. It sounds, it sounds better when it's lower because uh, it's heavier. Uh, guitar strings are a little looser. I like that, I like lower. But for a song that was conventionally written in E, 
that we're now playing on E flat guitars, it's always it, it, there's always something that's kind of like pickled to me when I go to hit a note and I'm expecting a particular note to come out and it's a half step sharp or something, you know. So uh, that's that. Steve, what is the most difficult song you ever had to learn? Oh my goodness, there's been a f quite a few. All right, well, it's not really a song. It's, I think I mentioned this in one of my last uh, sessions. Uh, there was a Japanese composer, there is, and his name is Ichiro Nodaira, and he's a contemporary composer, so his music is extraordinarily abstract, um, very atonal. Um, if you like that kind of thing, it, it, he's really pretty inspired, but if you don't, it sounds like hell. It's noise. It's unlistenable. Um, otherwise, for me, it itches a sp spot that nothing else can really get to. But he wanted to compose a piece for electric guitar and orchestra, and in the orchestral world, that's a no-no for the, well, maybe not as much these days, but in the conventional uh, orchestra world, uh, composers are not necessarily versed in writing for guitar because it's such an abstract instrument for an orchestra, especially an electric guitar with distortion or any of that stuff. Most composers do not know how to write because it's never asked for. But Ichiro wanted to write this big opus and he wanted it to feature an electric guitar. And it was called Fire Strings. So he flew to America and um, I, I kind of showed him the, you know, how to write for the guitar, the limitations, what, you know, what this mean, what various things mean on paper. And he took it and he ran with it and he wrote a piece of music that was so death defying that I had to spend three solid weeks alone uh, learning it. And, um, because, and it, w it wasn't like it was hard to, there was no melody. It, it's all very atonal. And it was hard because it was fast and it wasn't written for the guitar. It, you know, the composers, you know, they pick notes that may work on a piano, but, you know, try to figure them out here. Plus, he was experimenting with his newfound compositional guitar writing chops. So he would do, he would write, write things like, uh, within two bars of music, I would have to stretch a note, hit the, hit the volume uh, or the tone, switch the pickup, hit a flanger, vibrate the note as I released it, or anything, because he was just like, well, I can, maybe he can do this. And so I get this 30 minutes of sheer terror on the guitar to try to play. And I worked so hard on that, and that was when I first actually felt that I damaged my hand. I, I, I started getting the carpal tunnel thing. It went away, but um, yeah, that was, that was hard. That was really, really hard. And I gotta tell you a funny story. Okay, so <laughs> I go to Japan and I perform this with the Tokyo Metropolitan Orchestra. Very, uh, it's an incredible orchestra, very traditional. And they're playing this wild piece of music. It's called Fire Strings by a contemporary Japanese composer. And it's got this guitar part from hell, okay? And they got a guitar player, American Yankee Doodle, coming in, and this music was so, if I held the first page of the guitar part, the last page would stretch uh, maybe 20 feet, okay, or maybe 10, say 10, 10 feet, maybe 10, 12 feet. So in learning this piece of music, I actually had to figure out ways of folding the paper so that, and I had to practice changing the pages because there was no way I was going to memorize this. It was just, it was too abstract, you know, and it was in, 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 uh, just incredibly complex. So I actually, I actually had to like practice playing and then moving a page and then going back to the guitar and uh, this up a little bit. And I, I created this uh, folding system that enabled me to do this. So as I was, uh, you know, reading something, um, I would memorize the first few bars of the next page or wherever there was a rest, 
so that when there was a rest, I could make the change. And many times I didn't have much time. So I'm up in the front and I, we do the sound check and, and we had three shows, three, three different nights. And in the first night I get up there and, and I needed a, a music stand that was twice as big as normal. And it was flat like that, a little, little, little up like this. And I had the music spread out, it was all ready and I knew what I was gonna do. And, and you know, if you, if you lose your spot in this music, go home because you ain't gonna find it. <laughs> uh, so everything was working and I go off stage and I, and I guess when I was off stage, one of the stage hands thought he would do me a favor by taking my music stand and tilting it up like this so I could see the music better. <laughs> uh, I did not ask him to do that because I had it all, you know, so I go out there, my, my, my music stand is like this. I'm like, somebody's been sleeping in my bed, <laughs> you know? And you can't do anything about it. You can't go, oh, wait a minute, hey, I gotta fix my stand. No, the conductor goes tap, 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 and you're off. So I start playing, I'm like, okay, I'll get through it, whatever, you know? So I'm starting to play, and the music is, of course, insane. And I'm doing my thing, and I'm like, boom, 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 turn page. Turn page, you know, this kind of thing. So I get to this one challenging page turn, and I'm playing, I'm playing, I got it down, I had to go, mm, 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 mm. And when I went like this, <laughs> the music started to go like this. And I'm like, no way. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. My music is not going to fall off its the whole part unraveled on the lap of the first row. <laughs> so I'm playing and I'm watching this thing and, the, and I'm going, I'm reading the music. I'm like, oh shit, no, this isn't happening. And sure enough, the whole music, and the people in the front are just like, ah! And as it's falling, I'm reading it. And then finally, when it hit their lap, I'm like, don't move. <laughs> Finally, I'm like, oh, forget it. This ain't working. And I, I had to pick it all up, and I just had to drop out. You know, I had to drop out, and th there was no way I was going to be able to refold it and pick it up. So I just started listening very carefully, and something very odd happened. I realized I had it memorized, <laughs> and I didn't need the music uh, because I just started playing. And I'm like, okay, relax. Always relax, relax, relax. And that was a scary moment on stage. And you asked. <laughs> I've had a lot of scary moments. Well, maybe not a lot. Oh, yeah, there's been quite a few, actually. Um, how do you determine uh, other pants? All right. What's the worst? Th <laughs> Hi, Steve. Worst thing happened to you live on stage, musically speaking, if ever happened? Well, that was one of them, but uh, here's another one that, that's just funny. Okay, so I'm on tour with Frank. I'm 20 years old. I'm with Frank Zappa, uh, scared out of my mind. <laughs> not, not necessarily scared, but uh, interested. And Frank... Uh, this was the first tour, he would have uh, a whole retinue of songs that we had to have memorized. And on that first tour, I didn't have so many complex guitar parts. There was a few, but it was the second and third tour where, you know, I was playing all the really difficult music. Uh, but the first tour, and Frank would put the set list together right before the show. So he puts this one set list together, and then he would, ch he would tell you, he would give you cues throughout the show and he had various cues and you had to be able to follow them because he would do them at any time in the middle of any song. For instance, if he, if he went like this, that was a cue to make whatever you're playing reggae <laughs> because that's the roster thing. <laughs> so you would, you would be playing and if you're going kunk, 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 and he goes like this, you gotta go kunk, 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 or kunk, 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 whatever it is. And if he did this, that was ska because that was two Rastafarian dreads. 
So that was the cue, no matter where you were. If he went like this, that means whatever you're playing, play it in 5-8. And he'd go, gunk, gunk, de gunk, gunk, de gunk, gunk, de gunk, or seven, whatever it was. He had symbols for chords. Wherever you were, you just hit a big C chord, bam. And he would move his hands, and you had to follow them. You know, th this, was, this was fantastically fun. And Frank used to do it again. You, you never knew when he was going to do it. And he had this one cue that was fantastic. It went like this. Whenever, whenever Frank would do this, <laughs> that meant whatever you're playing, make it, make it heavy metal because it's got big balls. <laughs> okay, so one day before a show, Frank said to me, with the band there and everybody, he was going through the set list. He goes, during, after Cosmic Debris, I'm going to give you a cue, and I want you to go into Outside Now. So the Outside Now riff, incredibly beautiful riff. It goes... Uh... Whoops. I got... Oh, oh. Sorry, Paul. <laughs> it's like this thing in 11, and, and Frank said to me, After the solos in Cosmic Debris, I'm going to come. Shut up. I'm going to come to you and I'm going to cue you. And Frank's cue was a jump. He would like be standing there and he would just go. Okay, so that was the cue. And he goes, I'm going to cue you and you start outside now. So I'm like, okay, got it. I actually have a little solo spot. <laughs> so we're out there and we're doing the show and uh, it's Cosmic Debris and everybody's doing a solo. Now, occasionally, Frank would point to me and I would get to do a solo in Cosmic Debris, but I guess this night uh, he didn't. Uh, so everybody's going around and Frank's, Frank's coming towards me. And as soon as he comes towards you, you're like, you know, you're, you're lit. You know, okay, what's going on? And he comes up to me and he's doing the last solo. And what I thought he was going to do, because I forgot that he said go into outside now, I thought he was going to cue me to solo. So I'm like, oh, Frank's going to tell me to solo. Frank's going to tell me to solo. Yeah, right. So I'm standing there, and I'm waiting for him to come by, waiting for him to come by. And he comes up to me, and he gives me, he gives me the, he comes up, and he's playing, he's playing. And we're like this close. And, he, and he's, all of a sudden, he looks at me, and he goes. And I had completely forgotten that I was supposed to go into Outside Now. And the band stops, and I'm standing there like this. Eh? <laughs> and Frank just looks at me and he jumps again <laughs> and I'm like eh? <laughs> and he just goes ah, shit. and he turns around and he's, he's he started playing it and then I realized shit I was supposed to go into outside now so that was that was a one of the worst things that ever happened to me on stage. There was quite a few of those. No, not actually, not so many of those, but other episodes. Okay. Who close to you inspired the song Call It Sleep? It makes me cry when I hear it. Thank you. Um, when I was in high school, there was a lovely girl. Her name was Lori Good. And she was older than me. She was a couple of grades older. And she was uh, just a, a total sweetie, a real sweetheart. And she, um, she was beautiful. She was, uh, you know, she, I think she, you know, uh, some high schools have class this, class that. She had best looking. She was so beautiful and so sweet. And, but, uh, you know, there was something awry with her and she actually ended up uh, killing herself. And for us, this was such a shocker because the family was friends of our family. My brother was friends with uh, the, one, of the, one of her brothers. I was really good friends with one of, the, uh, one of the goods, Jerry, and they were really good people. And this was like, we, we hadn't really experienced anything like that. And at first it was such a shock, and then the, you know, the sadness. So at that time, that was a profound experience for me. And I wanted to write something. And I was at, uh, when I got to Berkeley, 
I had Mike Mangini. Is it Mike Mangini? Uh, Matheny. Mike Matheny. Pat Matheny's brother was my harmony teacher. And uh, we had assignments. And I wrote Call It Sleep as a harmony assignment. And it was to display Lydian tonalities. Uh, but it turned into a beautiful song to me. And I had writ written it for her. So that song is dedicated. And it's on the record, you can see, to Lori Good. And when I play it, I think of her sometimes. And I smile in my heart. And that's her. <laughs> Michael Bruccolari. Michael, how you doing, brother? Michael is uh, Michael Bruccolari is a, a guy that I went to school with ever since kindergarten, and just one of those great guys, really great guys, and uh, a real music lover and a player of the guitar, and um, was always really into music and just just a great guy. Mike, you're a great guy. I don't know if you're watching, but anyway. Uh, and I got your email today that uh, Mike asked me to marry him and his wife, or as him and his fiance, because I'm actually an ordained minister. <laughs> and uh, I was considering it, um, but it was postponed due to corona. So sorry, Mike. Sorry to hear that. Uh, but let me know if you reschedule it. And if I'm around, I will marry you guys. But don't blame me. Uh, thanks, Mike. But your question is, Tracy and I want to know what your favorite meal is at Vise in Naperville, Illinois. Ours is the Asagio Gnocchi. Well, it's not a musical question, but hey, it's about my brother, my brother Michael's restaurant in Naperville, and it's called Vise. And it is just, okay, I'm not allowed to talk about it because I sound like, I, I, I'll just sound like I'm hyping it. The, you, you, it, it needs no hype. It's the great. It's my favorite restaurant in the world, and no, no doubt because it's just so good. The food. I mean, you go there on a weekday, and you might have to wait forty minutes to get a seat, but the the food there is just amazing. And uh, you can say hi to my brother Mike, who was one of my greatest mentors in life. God, I love my brothers, and especially when they're giving me food from their restaurant. <laughs> but uh, what is the meal that I, I'm, it's just so hard. Um, now the gnocchi is pretty good. There's a mushroom caspaccio that he makes. I think that's it. And that's pretty dope, man. But uh, check it out if you're in Naperville, go to Vise. Steve, have you ever jammed with Eddie Van Halen? Yes, I have. <laughs> I'll tell you about it. Okay. Uh, hey, Steve, how am I doing for time? I lost track. Okay, Steve's not there. Okay, maybe I'll go a little longer. Okay, so back when um, I think it was, I can't remember the year, but it was Van Halen was pretty much at their peak. I think they were like fourth or fifth records. And Edward was a big fan of Alan Holdsworth. And, I, and so was I. So Alan was playing at the, um, uh, in Hollywood. And I went down and watched the show. And Edward came out and jammed with Alan. That was so amazing. I mean, wouldn't have expected that. And at the time, I was work, I'd just kind of gotten out to L.A. and I was working with Frank. So uh, I don't know how I finagled it, but I got backstage. And I got to meet Edward. And he, he was... He was great. He was funny and uh, kind of, you know, he was Edward, so uh, I didn't really say much. But then somebody told him that I was working with Frank Zappa, and he was a Frank Zappa fan, so he ended up, uh, we ended up talking. And uh, I said, well, listen, if you ever want to meet Frank, uh, I, I'm sure he'd love to meet you. Here's, um, here's my phone number. Call me. Never thinking he'd call. Sure enough, the next day, I get home at around noon, and my friend says to me, my roommate, um, one of four, <laughs> uh, he said, Steve, Edward Van Halen called. And I'm, whoa. And he said he wanted to know if uh, you can 
uh, hook him up with Frank. And I said, whoa, wow, okay. Well, uh, did he leave a number? He said, no, but I gave him Frank's number. And I'm like, dang, it doesn't matter if it's Edward Van Halen. You don't give out Frank's number, you know, if I had it in my book there. So now I'm like, uh-oh, what if Edward calls Frank? And right at that point, the phone rang. And I pick it up, and it's Frank. And he says, hey, sport. I'm like, hi. And he goes, Edward Van Halen's up at the house. Come on up. <laughs> so I guess Edward called him, and Frank said, come on up. And oddly enough, Edward ended up, we discovered he lived about a half a mile from Frank down the road. So I went up there, and it was me and Frank and Edward. And I think Dweezil popped in now and then. But... Uh, we just sat and listened to music. Edward played uh, Frank, uh, the, the new Van Halen record. Maybe it was Diver Down, I can't remember. But then of course, if you're with Frank and there's instruments around, you're gonna jam. So Frank and Edward started jamming and then I started jamming and the three of us just played. Me, Frank Zappa and Edward Van Halen. And it was fantastic. It was just a fun jam. So yes, that's my playing with Edward story. Dear Steve, dear Steve, can you share more about Gravity Storm? Not the pickups, but the piece. Yes. Gravity Storm is a song on uh, the story of light. And it's tuned down to C. The guitar is in a, it's a D, no, it's a D tuning. Let's see if I have one around here. Yeah. Actually, I don't have a drop D. It's not drop D. It's the whole guitar is tuned down. So that song was uh, one of those pieces that I just recorded the riff. I was fooling around. Just kind of like with this riff. And I recorded about 10 sec seconds of it onto my iPhone. And that was Gravity Storm. And then I, because I knew there was something in it that uh, had an inspiration in it, and, a, and a, there was enough of a pull for me to start working on it. And what that was was this, and it was a conceptual thing. It started out kind of conceptual. And the way these songs usually start for me is, I, and this is, you can try this. It's a really uh, great way to boost your creativity. You tell yourself, okay, what am I gonna do that's unique? And once you tell yourself that, there's an opening. And then it, it, you'll, you'll find something. And when I was uh, f uh, noodling about when the riff came, there was this. There was this like feeling of like gravity, you know, on the notes when I would play them. So then I just started fooling around with this riff. It's got this kind of, and, and ev uh, many of the notes throughout the whole song have that on the end of them. So this creates something that's, it, it creates sort of like an atmosphere, and you're not quite sure what it is, but it's there, you know, and it's, uh, I haven't played this for quite some time. But. And I always start out normal, so that when that kicks in, it has a weight to it. And it's very important when you do that, that you go like this. It's very important. crack myself up. Okay. All right, wait. And I try to get you know, you got 
a couple of those in there and it's kind of nice. Uh, uh, what does the other riff go? You know what? I'll work on it because I forget it and then I'll play it for you next week. But that's basically, you know, uh, throughout the whole song, you'll just hear these kind of like riffs that the last note bends down a little bit. Even in the solo or in the melody, you can hear it. It's also kind of difficult because of uh, uh, the, from the question from before, that guitar is tuned to concert 440 and Gravity Storm is tuned down a whole step. So even just playing it on that guitar, it doesn't sound like Gravity Storm to me at all. <laughs> um, all right. You have been a legend by word of mouth and your commercial works my entire life. But I have to say none of it's done you justice. I feel truly privileged to have witnessed that. Thank you. Um, well, that's not a question, but it's a very nice statement. Thank you. I'm extraordinarily satisfied with word of mouth. Um, there's a lot more people that know about me than I ever thought would. And I, if, if something commercial came along, besi you know, besides the early days with Crossroads and all that kind of stuff, I mean, these days, uh, not like the music's, well, I don't know anything, but it's not as if the music's going to be on the radio normally or anything like that, and it's, it's really fine because been there, done that. <laughs> uh, but yes, I do notice that uh, I'm kind of, uh, in some circles, a well-kept secret, and that's fine. All right, what else we got? Ashley Jackson, Jackson, do you find when you get into it, stopping playing is harder than starting? Yeah, yeah, that, that, that always required discipline for me to stop. Could you tell us about Misfits, one of, the, one of my favorite songs? And I'd love to know how to play it. Misfits was a song that I did when I was doing um, a demo for Roland and a device. I can't even remember it, so sorry. Uh, but I used all the sounds in it, and Misfits is just what came out. And uh, thanks for asking. I like that song, too. It's kind of a buried, I buried it in an obscure release. Uh, but it is, a, it's a sweet track. Um, but the guitar tone, the tone was never something I was crazy about. Uh, but I did listen to it not too long ago. Now, what did it, how did I write it? I, I can't, it was just, a, it was, it came from the infinity shelf, which is the shelf I have that has all the little snippets of ideas that I capture either on my iPhone or in various other ways. And uh, I had the melody and the chord changes for the verse, and that was all I needed. And I fleshed out the song, and uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Awesome, did you ever get to meet or play with Alan Holdsworth? Well, I knew Alan very, very well, but I never played with him, not many guitarists did. Uh, I was a big fan. The first time I met Alan Holdsworth was I was at Berkeley. I was going to Berkeley, and he was in a band called U2. And I had started listening to him when I was like 16. You know, when he was with, even younger, when he was doing all that great Tony Williams stuff, uh, and the other bands he was in. Uh, but then he joined UK, and they came to Boston. And I waited and waited and waited backstage at the Orpheum at the backstage door. And I was the only one there because he came late. He came right before the show. And the car door opens up and Alan Holdsworth comes out and he's carrying his guitar. And it was another kind of a stunning moment for me. Um, and he was so kind. He gave me his address and I wrote him a letter and he wrote back. I was so touched by that. But then finally, Alan moved to America and I moved California, and I moved to California. And one of the first uh, transcribing gigs that I got 
was I was transcribing some of Alan's stuff. And then he had called me because he was working on the this book, you know, his chord book. Um, what's the name of it? Um, if anybody knows the name, please please post it. But it's Alan has a particular uh, approach in his mind to the construction of music and what it means to him and how he brings things together to make the music that he makes. But it's, it's not very conventional. So he wanted to write this chord book and he wasn't quite sure how to convert or translate his uh, way of writing music into something that everybody can understand uh, or that a guitar player can understand. So I, I was helping him with that. And uh, that's when I first, but then through the years, I would meet Alan and meet, you know, and I would, every chance I'd get, I'd see him play. And we sort of became friends, you know, not uh, close personal friends. But then when I had Favored Nations, he was the guitarist that I wanted to sign more than anybody. And I went to him and I discussed and I said, I want to sign you. I will support your record. I'll make sure it gets out there. And he said yes, and I signed him to Favored Nations, and he never delivered a record for 17 years. I think that's about right. And I could never figure it out, and this broke my heart. But, uh, and, you know, I would call him, I'd say, how you doing? You know, I, I offered everything I could, gear, money, uh, studios, everything. But Alan was very picky about everything and very self-deprecating. Uh, perhaps one of the most brilliant, not one of the, I would say for me in my world, he's the most brilliant, he's the best. I, I, I can't even fathom. He's the one guitar player that I can listen to and, and I don't know what he's doing. <laughs> I mean, I know I can hear it, but I can't imagine it, you know? And everybody else I hear, I'm like, oh, I know exactly what they're doing. I can't do it, but uh, I can. I know. But when you hear Alan, it's like, what is that? And it's so beautiful. And there's so much melody. And the touch, the control is just phenomenal. So I'm like, and I'm going to have one of his records to release. And he would make tracks and send tracks, and we talk about them. And I mean, I, folks, I tried. I tried. I tried to the point where I, I almost became a big pain in the ass. And then I let, I, I backed off and he would write and he'd say, I'm working on it, I'm working on it. Uh, and then finally, uh, not, not long before he passed away, he sent me, I have probably 15 tracks. Beautiful, beautiful Alan Holdsworth instrumental tracks with these lush chords, no guitar no lead guitar. He said, this is the tracks I got, now I gotta do the, I could, he could never bring himself to do the guitars, or if he did, they exist on a computer someplace, um, and I don't know where. And I thought of the idea of taking those tracks and you know, offering them to, offering to have some of his favorite musicians do solos on them, and then release that. But it's, there's a lot of protocol involved that required things that I just couldn't, I couldn't, I just kept hitting brick walls. So maybe that'll happen someday. Maybe there's actually guitar parts existing on some of these tracks. Um, but if anybody comes across them, I own them. I actually own them. They're mine because I paid a lot of money for them and they deserve to be put out and that's what I would love to do if they exist. In any event, that's Alan. He was amazing. Okay. There's not a lot of music related questions, but uh, more stuff about me. Any fond memories of the movie Crossroads? You know, I had plenty, plenty. All right, I'll tell you one story. I guess this is turning in, into alien guitar stories. <laughs> I, I really, um, when I got offered the opportunity to be Jack Butler in the film, 
at first I thought, no, I'm not, a, I'm not an actor. And, you know, then the director and, and Ry Cooter kind of, kind of talked me into it. They showed me the script and I thought, okay, I can be this guy. He's a badass. I got that in me. I can be Jack Butler. And I read the script and I knew what it called for. Uh, so I built the duel with Rye. And Rye plays all the slide guitar. And all the stuff that Eugene and Jack Butler play, that was me, except the slide. And a funny story, a great story, one of the, one of the things that I enjoyed most about working on Crossroads was hanging out with Arlen Roth. Arlen Roth, some of you might remember who he was. In the 80s, he had a star licks, but he was a big, big proponent of guitar education, and he made these videos with various people for education on guitar. But he was just a great guy and a heck of a player, real great player, especially Slide. He was uh, on the set and working on Crossroads because uh, he was contributing a lot of the Slide stuff, and he was helping Ralph to be able to pantomime all that stuff. And he, I believe he was writing stuff for the movie, too. But he was a, a consultant to make sure that all the guitar stuff was going down believably and correctly. But he also has this incredible sense of humor. And we just clicked. And there was this one scene when the entire Crossroads filming for me took about, I think it was 12 days, and they were about 18-hour days. And those 18-hour days were filled with m minutes of filming and hours and hours of waiting around. <laughs> so that's why I, I'm, I, I don't ever want to be an actor. <laughs> but uh, this one scene, there was, there was things that were just hilarious to me. Uh, <clears throat> I, always, I always felt kind of funny acting because it was fake. <laughs> I love great acting, but, <coughs> excuse me, Corona. <laughs> so yeah, acting was a little bit of a challenge because <clears throat> it just felt kind of weird. Cause, but, I, but I thought that's for this character, I can go there. So in this one scene, I'm supposed to be, when I lose, when Jack Butler lose and he goes up to the note, and he can't get the note, and then he gets to that high note, and all the strings break, uh, or a string breaks, or what did I do? When I recorded that last note, I overdubbed like 12 notes, all at different speeds and stuff, to sound completely chaotic. Because the first time I filmed it, it didn't look like I lost bad enough. So I had to go back and film. A month later, they had to rebuild the entire set and refilm so that it looked like I lost more than it looked like I lost in the previous. <laughs> so <clears throat> that's why I put like 12 guitars on the last note. But every time that last note would come and that we were filming it, I'd have to kind of hit the note and go down on my knee like I was defeated. I was just terribly defeated and then embarrassed and ashamed. But whenever I would go down like that, I, I just something about it was so funny to me. It would just sound, it felt so funny that I would start laughing. Now, I pretty much nailed the whole the crossroads thing. Uh, I never had to do a retake. I don't know why. It was a bam, okay, that's it. Action, cut, good enough, you know. But they had to retake this scene many times because I because of Arlen. <laughs> because you ever notice you ever notice like when you're um do you ever have like a laughing fit and you can't stop? And if somebody else is in on it, forget it. You're doomed. <laughs> that used to happen to me. I have laughing attacks. Uh, and this particular situation where I was filming this, the camera was right here. And Arlen is standing in back of the camera. And every time I'd go down, he'd see me laughing. He would start laughing. So now we had this kind of like hysterical thing going on. So it was so difficult for me to you know, be Jack Butler and then hit that last note and then go down and, and come up and, you know, that look he gives. Him. It's just like the darkness of Jack Butler, the evil. And I'm going... <laughs> <laughs> trying not to laugh. And every time Arlen would start laughing, I would just break up. So that was it. 
that, that and the, the director was like, "What is wrong with you guys?" <laughs> so I thought I had it. I thought I had it. Arlen was behaving himself, but then the cameraman, the guy that was between us, he got the disease. He got the laughing disease. And right as soon as I would go like this, that's it. We would just start quietly laughing hysterically inside of ourselves, and this and and the, and the shot was done. It, it, it was no good. <laughs> So finally, the director had to have a word with me. <laughs> Sorry, Walter. That was Walter Hill. I told him, look, I'm not an actor. I'm a comedian. <laughs> anyway, so that was uh, something funny from the Crossroads movie. All right, maybe one more. Um, who comes up with the drum patterns? Everything is amazing. Thank you. I loved your work for years. Thank you. Well, um, I would say the vast majority of the times, every drum head is orchestrated by me on my music, uh, unless it's a jam or something like that. And that's because I hear drums. I'm a composer, so I hear things locking a certain way. Uh, so it's not uncommon in a band situation where you are uh, sharing and it's a band and like if you're the guitar player you might come in with a guitar riff and the bass player comes in with a riff and then the drummer says oh let me see what i can do for that and then the keyboard player starts playing that's how i think like u2 does it you know and then they just keep jamming until a section something sounds like something they want to use in a, a song i usually don't do that um i usually know exactly what i want the drums to be and many times I program them. Uh, if you take a song like, and of course sometimes I, I don't, you know, I'm just like, okay, play. Let's here's what I got. Let's see what this feels like. But a lot of times I'm I'm organizing kicks and hi hats and and snares. Uh, with Jeremy, when I'm recording with Jeremy, I might talk him through sections, give him some thoughts on kick patterns and stuff like that, but he's got gr incredible drum instincts. And occasionally I, I can ask a drummer to do things that just are very awkward for them, you know? So in that case, I, I rely on them to create something that works with what I'm hearing, but also uh, feels natural in a groove. Uh, so if you take a song like... Um, Okay, Kill the Guy with the Ball on Alien Love Secrets. Every single drum head, every hit, every kick, everything, I orchestrated. I had to because it had to be completely in sync with what the guitar was doing. And I know what, it's, what it should sound like to do that, or at least the way it, I would like it to sound. And, um, oh, I remember I had Dean Castronova in the studio to record that. And he's an, uh, he was an incredible, he is an incredible drummer. He did some other stuff where, you know, where he would, he would just come in and just listen to a song and bam. It's like Jeremy. Jeremy could just listen to a song and then just nail it. You know, it, it's one of those things, you know, some people have it. So Dean had this and I played it. I said, listen, I'm, uh, I'm thinking of programming this song because the drum part, I know what I want it to be and it's going to be very difficult. He's like, take me an hour. Okay. Uh, three days. And to his uh, credit, I don't know anybody. I didn't know Jeremy at the time, but I, 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 it would have been hard to get anybody to play this the way I wanted it. And poor Dean. Oh, boy. He went through every emotional feeling of distress that you can possibly have in the recording studio because I would say, okay, you know, like play this. No, not quite right. Oh, okay, let me get it again. Let me get it again. Okay, no, that wasn't correct. The kick has to go on the four E and da, you know? Okay, 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 okay. I got it. I got it. No, 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 wait, wait, do it again. Get it again. Okay. Okay. Was that it? No, not yet. You got the, <laughs> so this would go on until uh, the reaction was something to the effect of incredible anger at himself for not being able to get it, which was unnecessary because it was 
the stuff he was playing was incredibly impossible or just incredibly difficult to actually I would actually hear him almost weeping. That's how frustrating I was to him in the studio, recording the drums to kill the guy with the ball because I wanted it to be a certain way. And God bless him for delivering it. And you can hear it, and it is brilliant. There, I said it. <laughs> All right. Okay, I think we're good. I hope you guys, I'm sorry about the intro being late, the computer crashed, everything shit the bed. And uh, as a result, we had to push everything, and I had to use this little snowball because the entire Pro Tools rig is down, and that's why I can't play for you now through any backing tracks or anything. But I'll make my playing extra long next time. So um, thanks again for joining, and join us Thursday at noon for Under It All, where the topic is not so much uh, Steve's career-related things, but uh, more esoteric principles and exploring some of the other parts of my um, life, life's interests, spirituality, things like that. Um, and thank you all for the, the notes you've been sending. They're, they're very encouraging. Uh, before I did, um, I mean, I knew I'd have no problem pretty much getting through Alien Guitar Secrets, but uh, the Under It All stuff was... Uh, It was stuff I wanted to discuss and talk about, but always took a back seat to because uh, the time just wasn't right. And now it feels right. And your responses are encouraging. So thanks. And we will see you on Thursday, perhaps. And next week, I will make sure that I get every, well, we'll do our best to make sure that this rig is working properly. Uh, but until then, you guys have a great week. Enjoy this week. Enjoy your music. Enjoy your friends. Enjoy your family. Enjoy whatever is right in front of you at this very moment, wherever you are. And I'll see you next time. I see you. And I appreciate you. Thank you.